on this edition of Exposé, The Hurricane. The money. And these zips that are in red, the residents there collectively got more than a million dollars. The deception. I guess what really surprised me is not so much that people would submit a false claim, but that the government wouldn't have a mechanism to really crack down on this. Funding for Exposé has been provided by Labor Day weekend, 2004. Out at sea, a massive hurricane called Francis heads toward Florida. Saturday night, it hits 100 miles north of Miami. We've got uh, hundreds of thousands of people without power. Yeah, there was a lot of massive flooding going on. No hot water and obviously no electricity. In its devastating wake, 13 people are dead. Property damage estimated at $4 billion. Soon after, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, is on the scene to give money and supplies to help rebuild. They're the good guys. In 2004, the agency is headed by Michael Brown. Little does he know, he and FEMA are about to become the objects of a groundbreaking investigation that will reveal the mismanagement of a federal agency out of touch, even out of control. Hi, some Sentinel Newsroom. The South Florida Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale. 300 reporters and editors, 680,000 readers. Disaster response is always a story here in hurricane country. But after Francis, one reporter discovers something quite unusual. I knew that FEMA put out really nice maps on its website. So I go on there and I find an unusual map that says it's for individual assistance applicants per square mile. In other words, how many people ask for FEMA aid in every square mile of the state of Florida after Hurricane Francis? As expected, John Maine sees lots of residents seeking assistance where the hurricane has hit. But then he notices that people are applying for millions of dollars worth of hurricane aid 100 miles south in Miami-Dade County where there had been no hurricane that Labor Day. And that was like the eureka moment. And so in September 2004, a 17-month-long investigation begins with one inspired question. If the winds are blowing north, why does it look like the money is about to blow south? As reporters covering hurricanes, you know, as soon as the, the storm passes, you always want to go to the areas you think are going to be hard hit and, and look for damage and see how they fared. And this would be an obvious place to come right after a storm because it's right on the water and you have boats. And if you had any kind of serious wind damage or water damage, you'd see it here. There was absolutely nothing wrong after Hurricane Francis. Sally Keston calls FEMA. What she learns shocks her. FEMA had already approved at that point over $21 million to people here in Miami. Uh, and that was, in some cases, twice as much as they had approved in the counties that had a direct hit. And it just, it was one of those moments where we just knew we had a huge story. Hi, Kathy. This is Sally Keston. I'm a reporter with the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The paper's about to report that FEMA has approved millions for an area with no significant damage, where no hurricane force winds had hit. It seeks comment from the agency. A FEMA press officer responds, we just pay the claims that come in and are eligible. I don't know that we track where this thing is going. The response only encourages the journalists, four reporters who have come together for the first time as an investigative team. This is their leader, Joe Demo, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner from New York, who is new to the Sun Sentinel. I really wanted to work with uh, reporters who were interested in you know, naming names and kicking butt. The team that we work with here, John, Sally, and Megan, they see it wrong, 
and they decide they want to write it or at least expose it. October 10th, 2004, the first story of the series. Miami-Dade County did not experience hurricane force winds, yet it received millions of dollars in FEMA assistance. This is our first story that ran on October 10th, and here you're looking at the wind speeds, rainfall, and the number of households applying for FEMA money, and you can see it gets smaller and smaller as you get away from the storm until you get down to Miami-Dade County and it jumps up again. Phones were ringing after this thing ran, but it was, uh, uh, we knew that we had something and it was gonna be a good hit. FEMA leadership is silent, so Megan Ometz calls the head of FEMA, Michael Brown, directly. It is a little tricky to find a phone number in the Washington, D.C. area for Michael Brown. <laughs> he was quite upset with me for having reached him at home, and I explained that I wanted to give him every opportunity to comment on this major problem in his agency. He did not answer any questions in, in that call. Um, no, he, he hung up. <laughs> he won't ignore the Sun Sentinel for long. The next day, their reporting makes the nightly news. Yes, help, even if they weren't exactly hurricane victims. More than $1 billion in hurricane aid has been distributed so far. Where's the money going? Two reporters at the South Florida Sun Sentinel newspaper analyzed the government statistics and discovered FEMA's given Miami-Dade County $21.5 million to cope with Hurricane Francis. The charges are serious, and the story is national now. FEMA decides to stop ignoring the Sun Sentinel. Michael Brown showed up with his entourage of the Black Lincoln Navigators. He's slick. He is the ultimate bureaucrat. He talks past the question, past you, no matter what your question is, this is going to be his answer. We were all very adamant about, you know, just tell us what's going on here. And Michael Brown's position was, there is no problem. Bullshit. <laughs> That's my assessment. You know, he's, he's come in and... Uh, He's a, a bureaucrat who is uh, trying to, who's going to put his spin on it. This is 11 months before Katrina hit, and I walked out of that, that room thinking, this is a guy in charge of a federal agency, FEMA nonetheless, that's supposed to come in and rescue us after disasters. We're in trouble. As the reporting continues, John Maines monitors FEMA payouts and learns that the problem is even worse than the team first thought. We had a database of everyone who got money from FEMA and how much they got, and had a listing for a zip code in a county, but not their address. And these zips that are in red, the residents there collectively got more than a million dollars. The main thing that the people were claiming was destroyed was televisions, 5,750, and taxpayers paid $1.5 million for that. Air conditioners, radios, twin beds, microwaves, refrigerators, toys, washers, dryers, telephones. 13,000 people that got money, over $31 million. These are households in the poorest areas of Miami-Dade County. The reporters take us to some areas where the FEMA maps indicate the money was going. One of the best parts of the job is just to get out and talk to people, mostly because you start out your day and you really have no idea what you're going to find. Do you remember Hurricane Francis? That was the Labor Day storm in 2004. Right. Were there people around here that you talked to that really didn't have any damage but got FEMA money anyway? Oh, of course. I mean, you know that happens. If they're going to take Why advantage, think... they try to take advantage. Why do you think it happens? Money, free money. No other way to call it, free money. How much do people get? 9000 5000 13000 Megan and I were calling each other on the phone. She was in Liberty City. I was here. And we'd check in with each other. Hey, what'd you get? Did you find anybody? Yeah, I found people. And um, we'd trade stories. And it really gave us an idea of what was going on. Did you guys ever hear of um, people sort of damaging their stuff in order, you know, it might not be very good stuff well, to begin with? Yeah, that'll happen. Yes, you have to happen. That'll happen? How, how yeah. does it work? What happens? How does it work? You just go in and destroy your property. <laughs> That's right. Go in the just destroy everything you got and lay it on FEMA. Just turn on a hose or something? Yeah, turn on a hose, go in there with your hammer or something, just start to tear it up stuff and throw it out down the water. Why doesn't the government get a little wise to this? They don't... Well, I think they are wise to that what it is. They ain't spending enough time in the community to see what's going on. The 
questionable payouts aren't made only in the poor neighborhoods of Miami-Dade County. The Sun Sentinel would eventually report incidents in wealthy parts of South Florida as well. I guess what really surprised me is not so much that people would submit a false claim, but that the government wouldn't have a mechanism to really crack down on it. This is their statement that we've heard over and over again. FEMA has established processes that ensure that legitimate disaster victims' claims are honored. And I've seen these victims through four disasters, and we believe that no one here would take advantage of this unfortunate situation. And they sort of just gloss over the whole issue of all the misspent money. I think FEMA perceived us originally as like a gnat sort of buzzing around their head, and they thought if they could just swat it, lay low long enough, the story would go away. They underestimated the power of the story and our tenacity because we just kept going on and on. By the end of 2004, the team has published 17 stories about FEMA, Michael Brown, and disaster aid gone awry. Then, in January 2005, the Sun Sentinel's reporting provokes a fierce counterattack from FEMA. The charge? The paper has its facts wrong. Hurricane Francis did hit Miami-Dade County. In a press release, the agency states there were sustained and maximum up to 55 to 85 mile per hour winds in the parts of Miami-Dade County that received our assistance. Their source, they claimed, was NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. NOAA official John Bevan wrote up the post-storm report. If somebody actually said they got 75, 80 mile per hour hurricane force sustained winds in Miami-Dade County, personally I would question that. I'd like to see the record uh, that, that showed that. Another statement in FEMA's release catches the team's eye. Our contract inspectors are our first line of accountability. FEMA relies on a small army of independent contractors to inspect disaster-related damage and decide who should get aid. We wanted to know how are these inspectors doing the job, how are they signing off on these claims, and who's watching over them? One way reporters obtain information from the government is to make a request under the Freedom of Information Act, otherwise known as a FOIA request. After weeks, a package arrives from FEMA. And we were all excited. Hey, look, we got finally got these records that we had requested and we've been waiting weeks and weeks for from FEMA. And we open it up and, and all you see is, is a bunch of blacked out wording. It's laughable. FEMA made a very big mistake. They said, we know we're right because our inspectors told us. And then they said, but we're not going to tell you who the inspectors are. So we said, OK, let's find out who they are. And here are all the things that they got checked off for. And it was a slow, tedious process. It was really, to use the cliche, the peeling of an onion, because it was layer by layer on those things. And they slowly started to put a list of names together. Any tip from a source is pursued. Each triggers a search through newspaper databases, court documents, and other public records across the United States. In the end, the reporters find more than just inspectors' names. FEMA relies on contracted companies to scrutinize who they're hiring, and we just found that they weren't doing a very good job at this. Clearly, we were finding people that had what we thought were disturbing problems in their backgrounds. I remember one thing that I was really surprised is, is that they would not tell us what crimes would disqualify you from being a FEMA worker. There was drunken driving to embezzlement, criminal sexual conduct, a conspiracy to commit wire fraud and cocaine possession. This guide had served eight years in prison for grand theft, attempted robbery, possession of criminal tools, and aggravated burglary. This fellow had convictions for battery, driving with a suspended license, resisting arrest without violence, leaving the scene of an accident, contempt of court, and reckless driving. 
This guy was arrested on charges of child molestation. This fellow was doing FEMA inspections while there was a warrant out for his arrest for two drunken driving charges. She had been convicted of petty theft, two DUIs, worthless checks and shoplifting, and kicking and biting her husband. FEMA declined to comment on the criminal records the newspaper found or its confidence in inspectors. The agency would not answer questions about whether it was aware of the records or if not, what action, if any, would be taken. In March 2005, 20 disks worth of FEMA data arrive on John Maines's desk. Included is information on disaster assistance for all of Florida during the 2004 hurricane season. It's like Christmas when data arrives like this for somebody like me. It sounds very nerdy, but it's true. One of the first things we did was look at the funerals. Sally said, we want to see how many people FEMA says died. She was very suspect. We did the analysis really quick in the computer. As soon as we got the data, boom, more than 300 people had died, according to FEMA. The news is especially surprising to one person, the man overseeing Florida's death count. The information that we received from the Sun Sentinel was there was a much higher number of dead uh, that FEMA was saying were related to the hurricane than what we, the medical examiners of the state of Florida, knew to be the case. The overcount, if you will, of FEMA were natural deaths, and they ran the gamut from advanced AIDS, Parkinson's disease, stroke, high blood pressure, metastatic cancers, a whole number of things. He confirms the Sun Sentinel's findings, but Stephen Nelson also adds an interesting detail. He says FEMA has pressured medical examiners to file false death notices. Mary Ann Carlisle from FEMA stopped by. She actually came to the office uh, asking if you, me, can relate uh, this is death to Hurricane Francis as the family states the stress of the two storms was too much for her and she was literally scared to death. I'm not aware of anybody who's actually been scared to death, and that includes even the Tower of Terror over at Disney World. Uh, due to the stress of the hurricanes, it exacerbated her death. If you could just write one or two lines stating something to this manner, samples attached, uh, FEMA could pay the funeral expenses to help this family. My office manager, P.S. is, don't get mad at me, I'm just the messenger, uh, but uh, my initials there at the uh, bottom, S-J-N, where I write B-S. The paper reports that the FEMA representative remembers no such incident. FEMA refuses interview requests, but more people are taking notice. WFTL. Well, the federal government used hurricane aid money to pay funeral expenses for at least 203 Floridians whose death were not caused by last year's storm. Uh, the deaths include a Palm Beach Gardens millionaire recovering from heart surgery who died two days before Hurricane Francis. What? Last fall, the Sun Sentinel broke the story about people in Miami-Dade County collecting millions in federal disaster aid despite minimal damage from last summer's hurricanes. Today, those misspent millions were at the center of hearings on Capitol Hill. Eight months after the Sun Sentinel's first story appears, Michael Brown faces a Senate investigation committee. Michael Brown is forced to testify in front of the Senate about what we uncovered. Finally, people with some power are putting him up in front of a microphone and grilling him in all the kinds of questions we would love to have been able to ask him in all those months where they just denied us any access. Mr. Brown, do you disagree with Florida officials who said that the damage from Hurricane Francis in Miami-Dade <coughs> County was minimal? Do you disagree with the weather service assessment that there was no flooding? It's not a matter of whether I disagree or not, it's what the facts are. There was damage in Miami-Dade County. The hearing was a pretty contentious one. I would have expected that given all of the evidence that we had, that Michael Brown would have said they made mistakes, but they do better in the future. Uh, instead, it was quite the contrary. He was uh, very defensive, very contentious, and unwilling to admit uh, that there were major, major problems in FEMA's response. So when you're doing 885,000 inspections, there are going to be errors. This is where you and I have a fundamental disagreement. I don't think that there is a trade-off between 
responsive, swift assistance to those who are truly victims and protecting taxpayers against waste, fraud, and abuse. I think we can do both. I think had I realized just how bad he was that uh, I would have called for him to, to step down. The Sun Sentinel had done that very thing months before, in an editorial. The hearings are over, but the investigation continues. The team's on to a new FEMA story, though not about Florida. It's about Cleveland and Los Angeles and Detroit. For months, the reporters have been poring over records from 20 disasters across the U.S. After what we had seen in Miami-Dade and the reaction from FEMA, I knew the next step, we were looking into the 20 other disasters going back to 1999. I thought that was going to produce a mother load of information. And I suspected it would be basically the same story around the country. The question was, could we prove it? As they investigate fraud and waste in FEMA nationwide, another storm moves in. Its name is Katrina, and it's a monster. As it grinds toward New Orleans, the team watches and waits. We knew it was a huge deal watching it in horror like everybody else, and then immediately thinking, what does this mean for our investigation? We were in the final stages of finishing our two-part series on looking at these 20 disasters. Are we going to be criticized for now pointing out you know, the bad things that FEMA has done when here they are so desperately needed at such a, an, an incredible time. I mean, what is the relevance now, given the magnitude of Well, of, also, of the other thing we were worried about is, we write this story and everybody was going to say, why, why are you picking on FEMA? Mm -hmm. FEMA just saved New Orleans. Mm -hmm. FEMA does not save New Orleans. Its performance in the aftermath of Katrina will become a legendary disaster itself, replete with its own massive waste and fraud. On September 12, 2005, Michael Brown resigns. Six days later, Sun Sentinel readers learn the true scope of the agency's problems. It turns out, the paper reports, FEMA has been failing in disasters all over the country. They show that in 2003, Los Angeles area residents collected over $5 million in FEMA aid for wildfires burning over 25 miles away. The same year, Clevelanders collect $51 million for floods outside the city. The investigation affirms on a national scale everything the team had reported in its first local story. It had started with a eureka moment. The wind blowing north, the money heading south. One story, 17 months, 70 articles. An onion peeled. To put something in the paper and then have editors, reporters coming over and say what a great job that was, it doesn't get much better than that. Is it as good as sex? Uh, I don't know, but it's damn good. <laughs> you know, there's an adrenaline high. You know, it's better than drugs and, uh, and booze, I can tell you that. I think that's what everybody goes to journalism okay. for, is to come upon a story like that. It was the highlight of my career, unquestionably. In the fall of 2006, Sally Keston launched an investigation into a FEMA program called Project Hope. Its mission? To give crisis counseling to victims of natural disasters. She uncovered an operation flush with cash, but failing to do its job. Untrained and unsupervised counselors spent millions of dollars on, among other things, skits for preschool children and bingo games for senior citizens with no clear effort to target people who had experienced any disasters. Meanwhile, the South Florida Sun Sentinel had filed suit against FEMA to force the agency to release the addresses of all recipients of aid in the aftermath of four hurricanes and 27 other disasters. The 11th Circuit Court in June 2007 ordered FEMA to do just that. In an unprecedented ruling, the three-judge panel found that the public interest outweighed any privacy concerns. If FEMA does not appeal, the Sun Sentinel will reopen its investigation and pay a visit to the surprising and unlikely places where disaster dollars were received. Did FEMA help people out?
funding for expose has been provided by